Hi everyone. Today is the third installment of my Fiber Shed Conversations. I met Marion a couple of years ago when I was looking to be more deeply involved in our local Fiber Shed. She is the kind of de facto leader of the Chesapeake Fiber Shed Working Committee. She's um, committed to making Chesapeake Fiber Shed a valuable resource for makers and for producers alike. Her felting is just simply gorgeous and it embraces all of the fiber shed values, that of local fiber, local dyes, local labor. So I hope you love this conversation as much as we loved having it. I'm here talking with Miriam Bruno and um, she is a felt maker and she's kind of the force behind um, Chesapeake Fiber Shed Working Committee. And that's how I met her was through the uh, Chesapeake Fiber Shed. So, um, hi, Marion. Hi, thanks for having me. Great to see you yeah. this morning. Yeah, it's really great. Um, so, Marion, you're in Virginia. I'm in Maryland, and it's going to be a warm day today. But it's been like sweater weather up to now. Up until now, and there have been some pretty chilly days. So, but today yeah. is glorious. And chilly nights with down below freezing. But, like, I'm just wearing a little you know, linen top. And although my hands are a little cold, <laughs> they'll warm up by noon. I'm sure. Yeah, it should be nice. So tell us a little bit about your creative journey. How did you get um, interested in textiles and making? Have you, have you always been a maker or, you know, I, uh, tell us you know I guess the making side comes from growing up with parents. My mother would sew, knit, crochet. My father would paint so between the two of them, there's always something around. And I pretty much attribute it to my mother always giving us a craft kit of some sort or some kind of needlework kit every Christmas. And I, I realized it was to keep us busy and out of her hair for the afternoon, but it gave us all something to do. So that's pretty much where it started. And then over the years, um, I dabbled all the time. I was always embroidering or making something. And then it just sort of snowballed at some point. And I started, I took a felt making class down at the Art League in Alexandria, Virginia. And I was just mesmerized by the magic of making felt. And that was the felt making journey. And so now I'm still making felt, but I also add embroidery to it and paint and other things. So I have a good time. And you make beautiful echo printed felt as well. It's just gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you. Those were very fun to do. That's from a, um, a style of printing called a dirty pot by a woman named Nicola Brown in Ireland, where you don't have to add a mordant. You use the natural mordants that are in the, uh, you put in a horseshoe and onion skins and any kind of plants you want, and then print them up and steam them for a while or boil them. That's yeah. cool. Where did you get a horseshoe? <laughs> I have a, I have a niece who has a small ranch out in Colorado. So when I was visiting, I asked if I could have one. So, because I'm thinking, how would I ever get a horseshoe? Well, I do have, I have a spare if you need it. <laughs> yeah, I really horses get a lot of shoes. I, I I guess so. I was never a horse girl, so thankfully that was that passed me by. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's exciting to think about all the different things that you can do with textiles and just local plants that are around. Um, and how did you find the fiber shed is most people that I've been talking to their entry into it is Rebecca's book. Is that how you came to Actually, it? Actually, my entry into it was I had decided I wanted some local Gotland raw fleece to work with in my felting and didn't know how to find it. And I thought, well, that's crazy. As someone who likes to make, why don't I know where to get this? And so I called around and didn't find them. Someone sent me up to the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival, which, of course, I was able to find some. But it just struck me at the time that, you know, wow, why don't I know where these sources are for what I want to make? And then it also came about when someone was taught, used the term fiber shed, and I had never heard that. So that sent me down a Google search of looking to see what is this about. And as I looked at the website, then I bought the book and read the book. It just struck a chord and it sent me down this journey I've been on for several years of looking to see what do we have locally? Why was I not using more local goods and why aren't they more accessible to other artisans? 
And so part of that was how I got involved and it resonates with me. Mm-hmm. But you know, just like we eat every day, we clothe our bodies every day, and yet we pay so little attention as to the source of them. We worry about our vitamins, we worry about what goes in our bodies, but our, we're not really that worried about what goes on our bodies. And let's face it, our skin is one of the greatest organs organs we have. It's, you know, you know, we talk about how you can get rashes from wearing the wrong thing. And so being a little bit more aware of what was on my body as well as what was going inside. Yeah, and I think people just don't, I don't think that they have a clue. I didn't, I just speak for myself, just that like the finishes on fabrics and things like that can actually like enter your body through your skin right. and can a actually affect your health. Yeah. Right. And if, um, and if you're, di- you know, if it's something that's a dyed piece that isn't naturally dyed, um, that, you know, again, it can just, it enters your body through your skin and we, we just don't, it, you know, your skin isn't turning blue or purple or something like that. So it's like hard to understand that those things happen. Right. And we also don't, you know, you think about one of the other things Fiber Shed has done for me is this learning of we take textiles for granted in our everyday life. We have table linens, we have towels we use every day. We wear all these clothes and yet where do they come from and who made them? And as I've learned about the fiber, as I've learned about various types of fiber, as I've met producers of fiber like yourself, I've, you know, I never knew that how much work went into creating a yarn and how do you design a yarn for its particular qualities. And I think that's something that's good for us to know. It gives us a gratefulness or appreciation for what we clothe ourselves in and what we use every day. Exactly. As a maker, I've always loved to work with beautiful things. I like to have, uh, I love when I use handmade pottery in the kitchen because it makes me think of the maker and the story behind it. And I think sometimes having that connection to what we wear also makes us feel good. You know, you wear something handmade and you think of the love that went into it and the time. And I think it's an educational process for everyone. And I think Fiber Shed is well positioned to help people understand where their clothes come from and why they're important and why they should be valued and not just thrown off into a landfill. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Because that's one of our, our biggest problems is that. And and it does open your eyes to, you know, what does it take to go from you know, a, a seed of cotton all the way to a cotton top. And, um, you know, I went to some woolen mills this summer in, you know, big commercial mills and looking to see at their process and just what it takes to make, you know, a thin commercial, you know, wool suiting for a man's suit, or in this case, it was um, all of our military uniforms. And just like, you know, just what the process is, how hot it is, what the smells are, you know, how many steps there it takes and how many people are employed in that process. And that's just one tiny bit of the textile system because we don't have, you know, we, we've lost the infrastructure um, here in the United States to right. be able to make our own cloth for the most part. You know, this is, it's a very tiny part of the world production that these two um, companies are doing here in the United States. So, yeah, that's it's- true. And also, if you think about hand spinners, I mean, that's been one of the things I've learned is I've had, I remember suggesting to someone that they go to a fiber festival and they said, who would pay $40 for a skein of a yarn? And when you think about what it takes to get that wool off of the sheep, right. to grow the sheep wool in the first place, to get the wool off of it, clean it, spin it, it's it's the bargain of the century and people forget that what they're wearing didn't just come out of thin air right right and when you look at some you know there's some of these fast fashion places which i shall not name but you know where you can get a five dollar pair of jeans and you think about all the time and effort of the people that went into that to you know they're, they're just getting paid pennies on the dollar you know, if that, if that, yeah, if that, and we also see how it's polluting streams. And the big thing we're hearing now is microplastics in the water is, is we wear plastic clothing that they shed and we're all now drinking. I think the statistic I heard was every, every week we drink a credit card worth of plastic. Some I knew it was a lot, but I never heard it 
express it's that something way. like that. It's like a yeah. way, but it's it seemed a shocking amount. Yeah, I think in Rebecca's book, doesn't she talk about that 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 microplastics are even in fetal tissue? So right, you know, and they have found it as far as the Antarctic now, in the core samples they take. So it's everywhere. Yeah. And so and while just, we can't change the things that's already there, we certainly can slow it down. We can slow it down. And I think what I want to see people do more, because I've seen it myself, is to be more mindful about what you wear and what you purchase and how much you purchase. You know, buy less, buy natural um, fibers when you can. And it becomes almost those little tiny steps that we can take every day to make our world a better place. Exactly. And that feels good. You turned me on to this book, Wear No Evil. Yes. I hadn't heard about it before. One of my favorites. Yeah. And I've talked about it before on the podcast. I did a whole podcast on, she, there's 16 factors. I forget what she, the integrity index. Right. And um, it's just a really nice way to, to start thinking about switching over um, into more mindful dressing because we can't just you know, say today, okay, I'm not going to wear any of the stuff that I already have. Um, Cause we also, here's the conundrum. We also don't want to put that into the landfill, right? Right. So and we know that's donating to charity. Most of that ends up going to landfills. So that's not the best solution either. Exactly. So doing tiny bits, like, you know, again, choosing as you go forward, choosing all natural fibers so that they could be composted. Um, yeah, there are lots, that's another thing about her book that is so great is choose the, she always says, choose the three or four factors that appeal to you, or maybe two, and just say, I'm going to, when I shop, I'm going to be more conscious of, is it a natural fiber? Where was it made? Is it local? Is it ethically sourced? Um, all of these sorts of small factors that you can do. And just and gradually, if you do it a little bit at a time, I mean, I don't know that, the, you know, look for naturally dyed versus chemically dyed. And, you know, even though someone might say, well, you know, natural dyes aren't that they're not, it's not that they're tox non-toxic. It's just that they do, they degrade, which is a better, you have to think of the full picture. And it's not just what the dye is on your clothing today, but it's what did it take to get that dye? What is the process that was involved? How much water was used dyeing it as well as what happens to it once it starts to decompose. Right. Yeah. So that, you know, if it's a plant dye, you can put it into your compost. Right. Or even if you're using cochineal insects or something that can, those can also go into your compost. And, you know, it, and so it's that whole idea of circularity, you know, that it's going to co come from the land and it's going to go back into the land. Right. It's, you know, I've taken to when I have scraps of felt that are trimmed off of a piece, I chop them up and they become mulch in the garden. Oh, cool. Yeah. So you have a way to like put it all back. If you can't have a use for it, then find another use for it. Can I, did that make sense? Yes. It, it would be fun. I just, and I, I was just thinking about that as like, yeah, you could sew all the different colors together and make like little mulch blankets around your trees that would be like qu little quilts. <laughs> <laughs> or you could Only just chop them work. up and leave them. It's much faster. <laughs> yeah. And you okay. want them to decompose. Yeah. But there's so much, I mean, I, we just did the sustainable cloth challenge here in the Chesapeake Fiber Shed, as you know, and seeing the variety of beautiful things that people made from local fibers and the skill set that we see around us. And yes. it's, you would love for more people to appreciate the local craftspeople and what they make and view it as, as a viable alternative to some of the things that they wear or use. Exactly. Or use, yeah. Because we had... Um, the, one of the things that was good about our sustainable cloth challenge was we also had um, the one of our streams, we called them streams, was, um, you know, upcycling. So we had people that, you know, re, you know, took old linens and made quilts out of them or took old linens and made some rugs out of them right. so that you again, you're keeping those things out of the landfill. Mm -hmm. And they were beautiful, beautiful objects at the end. They were. Yeah, they were fantastic. And it does make you think, what can you do with what you have? And possibly thinking more about how can we swap and trade those with each other 
just so that they stay out of landfills because you may not have the capacity or the desire to upcycle everything you have, but ways to do that. And I do know that in on the commercial level, there are companies like Material Return that are taking the scraps from you know textile manufacturers and trying to recycle those into yarn. But we can do small things on our own. Right. And and sharing. It's like when I have clothing that I don't necessarily want to wear because I retired and <laughs> don't need some work clothes, but there ought to be, I hope that there's someone out there that can wear them and use them and not just upcycle into a pair of mittens, but actually put them to use for a while longer because right. they do show that the longer that you keep things in use, the lower its carbon footprint overall. And I think that's something to aspire to. Right. And also, if even if something that you buy today, if you are using it for a longer period of time, it's basically the cost, you know, has goes down as you use it more. Right. I mean, the mm -hmm. cost per wear, I guess, would be what it is or um, even. Um, it's not only cost per wear, it's cost on the planet as well. Exactly. Exactly. And even finding those if you have to go to a fancy party, you mm -hmm. know maybe using one of those services like um, rent the runway. Yes, exactly. So that again, it's not being, you're just not buying it and wearing it one time. Um, or oftentimes people do resale and you can find things on eBay, Etsy, thrift shops and the like where you can go see if you can find what you need there. And I think getting away from this stigma that it has to be brand new and shiny if to be cool I think making it so that if you're upcycling, that that's a positive and that's something to be applauded, not ashamed of. And I think that, you know, we did have a, a youth uh, group in our sustainable cloth and one of them, I think, and maybe all, th all four of them are, are really into thrifting and using things and remaking things. And I think that a lot of young people, they aren't seeing it as a stigma anymore. They are seeing it as like a treasure hunt. You know, what can I find today? Yeah, because they're doing it too. <laughs> yeah. But it's good to see that shift, that shift in thinking, and to see more of it would be great. We even saw, um, a, I guess it would you call them a yarn company or maker um, at Shenandoah Valley Fiber Festival, who was taking apart sweaters and putting the yarn back into skeins. Right. Right. One of the young people in our sustainable cloth challenge had taken an item that she had knitted years ago, but didn't like and wasn't wearing and apparently re-knitted it directly off the old sweater. Just yeah. repurposed it into something else she liked more. So that's, you know, that's all. There's so many awesome ideas that we can do. And, you know, if you don't have, if you aren't a maker, you don't have the sewing skills, you can find some of those people in in your own neighborhood, in your own locale. And part of that is like joining a fiber shed affiliate and find, or, or even just going on an affiliate's website, wherever you are. Right. And, and seeing who's available locally to find and what you have. And I think just like other fiber sheds, the Chesapeake fiber shed has an email address where you, if you can't find something, people can write and ask, and we'll ha be happy to s let them know what sources we have. We also have a map that you know gives the location and various um, producers, makers, mills, places that they can get them. What I'd like to see, we actually even have some retailers. So it'd be nice to see more. Right, right. And uh, you know, there's there are people out there that are willing to like knit for you. We have, you know, one member who already knit a sweater for a beautiful, beautiful sweater for someone in the um sustainable cloth challenge. And I think she might be knitting your sweater for next she year. She is going to be knitting mine. Yes. <laughs> well, I never learned to knit. I'm sure my mother is not happy about that at some point. But. Well, again, how many, how many hobbies can we have in our lives? Right. That's true. It's yeah. hard not to go down rabbit holes. You see something interesting and you want to pursue it or a new technique. Felt making just struck a chord with me because I liked the physicality of it. It's very much a hands-on process. And I like the magic where you take just fibers and lay them down and then they solidify, they they uh, meld into a solid piece. And that's very fun to watch and do. Yeah. And it is very physical with the, the water and the soap and the- And the rolling. The rolling. The agitation. 
because to make felt you have you basically need water and agitation to get it get the fibers to blend. I've always thought it has to be hot water. Does it have to be hot or it just does water? not have to be hot? It just goes faster if it's hot, okay. if it's warm. Hot water, much like you don't want to scald yourself, you wouldn't want to scald your fiber. But okay. warm water just opens up the little bristles along the wool fiber that helps them connect again. But you can definitely do it cold and you can also do it without soap. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, and there's needle felting too. There's so. needle felting as yeah. well, which um, some people find incredibly relaxing. <laughs> I find stabbing at something thousands of times not very relaxing. <laughs> so. Yeah. But there's some beautiful pieces that people have made. That some nice figurine kind of things yeah. that's you know, beautiful. Quite realistic. Yes. Yeah. And the thing about felt that is so interesting too is that, you know, it, it can be two-dimensional, it can be three-dimensional, it That's can right. be, you know, it can be utilitarian or it can be totally funky. It's, yeah. you know, it's, it's wide open to interpretation. Yeah. One of the things I always encourage, I have friends who don't make, and I always say, well, try it because even if you don't pick it up as either a hobby or as an avocation, you, what you will do is come up with an appreciation for what it takes to make something. Exactly. And you even made, you made a book cover for your, your sustainable cloth journal. I did. I just, it's so cute. I just felt it needed, I had to start somewhere. And since I wasn't quite inspired yet, I thought, well, I at least start to journal the process. Did you sew, so like, did it, you have to cut and sew? No, belt? I actually made a resist out mm -hmm. of um, foam underlayment from a floor that I had left over and use that and felt it around that. So it you makes have, like a little the pocket. size of what you want and then you um estimate it, you enlarge it by your shrinkage factor. Oh cool. And then it was made in one piece. But you can cut and sew it. I've done that as well. Wow. Yeah. There are lots of you can make all sorts of things, book covers, clothes, we have shoes, bags. Yeah, hats. Yeah. I made a hat. I felt it a hat. It was fun. Do you wear it? I gave it to to uh to my loom godmother, so I don't have it. <laughs> I have a I have a picture of myself in it, but well, you'll I have don't. to come down and make another. Yeah. Out of out of some of my mohair, some of my mohair bats. That would be good. Yeah, you should. You should be wearing your own fiber. <laughs> I do. I do do that a lot. I do do that. Yeah, your beautiful fiber is in the back of our Chesapeake Fiber Shed backdrop that we use at events and lovely, lovely fiber. Thanks. So like I said at the beginning, you got me into reading this book, <laughs> Where No Evil. So I was going to, you are a prolific nonfiction reader. I am. Um, you're not reading, um, you know, juicy mysteries like I am, <laughs> probably. So do you have some suggestions of books that... Um, I'm currently I mean. reading um, Fabric by Victoria Finlay, which is a nice history of various types of fabric. Um, other books, probably one of my favorites that I've read recently was called Raw Material, Working with Wool in the West by Stephanie Wilkes. And it's very funny. And it's kind of her journey from being a computer tech to ending up a sheep shearer out West. Oh, wow. And um, quite a journey and pretty interesting read. So I, that reads almost like a novel. Um, I do recommend Wool by Peggy Hart, mm -hmm. which is unraveling an American story of artisans and innovation. It's not a quick read, but she's got great illustrations. And I think it's good for all of us to know where our, where our fiber comes from. And, and of course the fiber shed book, I think everyone should read it. Exactly. The wool Very book, I, I thought it was I, I have to tell you, I didn't get too far in, in into it because I did um, fade out a little bit. But um, it was I think I got up to the Civil War because she really starts out with, you know, how wool started to be used in the colonies um, yeah. and how it was used and who was doing the work and lots of facts and figures. If you're a history buff, that's a really great book for you, I think. Yeah. And yeah. I do like history, which is great. Um, yeah, and there's so many, it's funny, you start doing this, it's when I was at the Rhinebeck Festival, someone recommended a book called Worn, and it's about the fibers that we wear, 
I and so did. there's, a, great, there's a lot out there. If anyone has recommendations, I always want to hear them. Yeah. I'm, and I haven't heard Warren before, so I think I want to look that up. That sounds interesting. Yeah, it's a, it looks to be another history of what we wear and why. So um, the, the Finley author, did she write a book about color before? She did color and she did jewels. Okay. Because I think they're quite good. Yeah, I've read the color one. It was really fascinating because I think that she went like through many colors um, and how they started and what they were used for in, mm -hmm. in artistry and stuff like that. Um, so I'll, I will put those um, links in the on the, the page for the website or hello for the podcast so people can find those if they're interested. If they're interested. Yeah. yeah. And if the, anyone has recommendations, they can put them in your, on your podcast. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Let us looking know. For something new to read. Right. So what are you working on now? Creative. Yeah. On the table right now are, is a very simple project. It is pillow backs out of local Jacob wool to use for a few more of the eco printed pillows that pillow fronts that I made using the Merino from black sheep farm. And that's just a quick one. And then I have, I want to make a tunic for winter, just a slight turtleneck. So the, I've designed the pattern and I will be laying that out soon. <laughs> um, probably next week while the weather is warm. Yeah. And I'm going to be using again, Merino that's that I locally sourced. Oh, so fun. And is that going to be dyed in any way or printed um, or? Not yet, but if you'd like to talk about dyeing and would like to help me dye it, that would be marvelous because you're such an expert. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we could, all the, the pieces of felt that you've made for um, our natural dye um, journal that we have on the Chesapeake Fiber Shed, they have all taken dye so well. Right. It and turned that's out a, really beautiful. That's in your, your um, mohair as well mm -hmm. as the merino that I sourced from Martha. Well, I'm planning on making a sweater. Um, I wanted to use this Rambouillet bulky that I just had made. Um, it's the Rambouillet is from Pennsylvania. Um, and I bought part of a man's, a shepherd's um, clip from, and it's just beautiful yarn. So I, and I was thinking, well, how do I want to dye it? And I think I'm going to dye um, with walnuts. I think I need to run out there and start getting some walnut hulls. It's a little bit almost late in the season, but I still have quite a few on the ground that I can get to make well, a nice brown sweater. I don't have a brown sweater. Yeah, well, the sweater that is going to be knitted for me that's out of fiber shed wool um, or alpaca, it is um, dark brown. But I also was mesmerized by the color of woad, of weld, I'm sorry. Weld, yeah, that bright, the bright it's yellow. Deep, it's like a yellow green. And it was so beautiful that I would like to try to dye something that color because it's very striking. Yeah. Well, we can start, you can put, weld, weld grows well in our area. You can, you know, plant some in the spring. Well, I have seeds. In fact, I'm starting to collect my seeds for a dye garden. It'll be my very first this coming year. Oh, that'll be fun. Yeah. A small raised bed so I could experiment. Yeah. I'd also like to experiment. The next rabbit hole I want to go down is making natural watercolors. Yeah. I like to keep watercolor journals. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice to have the plants that grow in my own yard that make my pigments? So do you have that book, the Botanical Ink book? I do. Okay. I've read it. I have not done anything. I, know I did make walnut ink, which I have some. So one of the days that we all got together, we did Hopi Sunflowers. Yes. You were there. Yes. And so yeah. I, um, I let that evaporate. So I have some of that. I should, op I was thinking I should open it up and see how it's, see what it's like but it it made kind of a charcoal color oh that would be nice yeah I will happily donate that to you thank you I'll happily take it okay I'll make you some watercolors as I experiment well you can well I don't I don't watercolor but it's never too soon to too late to start yeah it would have to be totally abstract so yeah <laughs> that's just the way it is oh. 
It doesn't have to be perfect. That's why I keep journals is that it's very quiet art that you can do for yourself. And if you get the proportion wrong or if you don't get it quite right, it doesn't matter because it's for you. And I think often people get intimidated by art, but I think everyone has a little bit of the artist in them. I and totally. by doing a small journal or a daily journal and people can go on Pinterest and see all sorts of things about urban sketching or journal keeping but it's a way to keep art in your life and be aware of color. You can also collage and cut and paste, but ways to just keep yourself looking and observing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's always fun, but yeah. Felting will, what I'm trying to do is get enough produced now. So when I want to embroider it, I have the winter months to do that. Oh, good. That'll yeah. be great. It will be well, great. I'm looking forward to actually getting a few things done. We've had a busy fiber festival season this year. We did. Yes. And it is winding down. So the other thing that I'm working on is I'm, I'm widening out my line of naturally dyed uh, yarn there. It's not, it's not local, locally dyed at this point, but I'm using uh, fair trade um, dye stuff. So I have some, some neat colors in the works. So that's exciting. Oh, I'm excited to see that. Yeah. So again, it's like, this is, this is the slow season. So it's a time when, you know, we can experiment with stuff and, you know, pick up new things and, um, and do something fun. Right. It's, there's so much out there. And when I look at the natural colors that you and Kirsten have achieved in our natural dye journal on the webpage, they're so beautiful and they all go together mm -hmm. and it's such a gorgeous palette. It's very inspiring and it, it's amazing that we don't wear more of them. And I know people worry that they don't last as long, but you can always re-dye them. Right. Or just, or just value what color they are at this moment. You know, mm -hmm. it's, you just have to, you, ha you have to pick, you have to pick what you're going to make with them because you wouldn't want to um, like do a color work, stranded color work with two, with dyes that aren't going to stay the same color because then you will lose all that special work that you did. But if you have, you know, like a, a nice kind of plain background or a cabled background and it all kind of fades at the same time and, you know, it's going to change throughout the life of the garment, which is also going to be pretty special. They are beautiful. They are beautiful. And we've had the colors up at the Chesapeake Fiber Shed table. People are drawn to them. They can't yes. believe how beautiful they are. Yeah, because people think, I think it, in people's minds, naturally uh, colored or nat natural dyes are all, you know, yellow and brown and well, maybe blue because you have indigo. And right. that's not and true. What, it's not true. And what people need to understand is that there are lots of subtle colors when you start to look. And that just because it's natural doesn't mean, mean that it's shaped like a hop sack or it's the color or it's beige. It doesn't have, you know, wearing local and wearing natural doesn't have to be dull right to be quite beautiful right which leads us back it. and to make something every day you know express your creativity because everybody has it there they do yeah they everybody do. has an inner artist whether you're right now maybe you're expressing it in what you cook or how you garden but it also can be you know something that you make with your hands that's very true and as someone who likes to make things, I realized long ago that I love the process. Yeah. And I've learned that, you know, if a felt piece doesn't turn out that well, I just chop it up and turn it into something else or it goes to the garden. But yeah. you have that, in, that enjoyment of getting to make something with your own hands and using a different side of your brain. And it's fun. Right. It's really fun. Yeah. And, and it, and I, and you get a certain amount of pride in it too, because you did make it. Oh, there's nothing better than you make something and someone walks up and goes, that's beautiful. And you're like, wow, yes. someone else feels what, you know, is seeing what I see. Exactly. So. That's beautiful. Well, thank you so much for joining me Thanks today. For having me. Yeah, it's been a really fun conversation. And like I said, we'll put the all the links for these books that we talked about in the show notes. Great. Have a great day. Yes, you too.